afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this month's IQ Academy webinar. Thank you for taking the time out to join us on our bite-sized session this month, where we'll be taking a look at blast performance monitoring with uh, Dr. Rob Farmfield of EPC UK. If you have any questions on today's session, you can send these through on the questions panel just to the right of your screen. If we don't get a chance to cover any of these, we will ensure they're uh, addressed in the follow-up materials after the event. And we'll also have a short questionnaire that will be displayed at the end of the session today. And please take the time to complete this if you have a chance, as your uh, feedback helps us to keep the Lunch and Learn webinars relevant to your needs. Our branches are also running a number of events over the coming month. Details are available on the current slide. For further information, please contact your local branch uh, secretaries. Their contact details are available on the branches page of the IQ website. And we'll also uh, summarise all the upcoming events in the uh, email that we are following out to you next week. And I'll now hand you over to Rob. Thank you, Dave. Good afternoon, everybody. So today we're going to look at blast performance monitoring. I've just subtitled it a team effort. So first of all, um, it's really important to remember that what we're talking about here is a joined up approach. So it involves everybody. And we need to remember that drilling and blasting is just the first part of the rock breaking process. So I've listed the what I consider to be the rock breaking process here, starting at drilling, blasting, loading, hauling, crushing and then secondary processing. Just as an example, if we change, for example, the type of explosive we were using, what we're really interested in is the downstream impact of that change. So for example, has it affected the energy consumption in the primary crusher? If we were to change something in the drilling, for example, changing the hole diameter, we would want to ask ourselves the question, What's happened downstream has, for example, it changed the quantity of fines that we're generating. So there's lots of questions to ask there on that rock breaking process. In reality, what we're asking ourselves is what's the most economical way to achieve the desired end result? The other question you're asking yourselves is if I change my drilling and blasting costs, what will that do to my downstream costs? So there's a, a link. The important thing is to remember that this is a linked process. I'm tempted to say that some procurement people tend to separate all of these things out. So they might look at the drilling costs, the blasting costs, the loading, hauling, crushing and processing all separately. We must remember that they are all linked together. There's one unknown sort of factor. Well, it's not unknown, it's known, but it's an unknown. And that's geology. So geology has a great effect on the drilling and blasting process. Uh, I'll demonstrate that to you later on with some videos. The other thing that we must remember about drilling and blasting is the unfortunate side effect, and that is vibration and air overpressure. So there are many examples around the UK where actually controlling vibration and air overpressure is the main controlling factor for the drilling and blasting. And then, of course, that may mean that we're having effects downstream. So the, the vibration and air overpressure control can have an adverse effect downstream. So that's the process that we have. That drilling, blasting, loading, hauling, crushing and processing is a linked series of events. It's worth perhaps just noting that drilling and blasting is at the beginning of that link. So anything we do in drilling and blasting will affect all of those below it. If we change the loading and hauling, it doesn't affect the drilling and blasting. So when we're looking at blast optimization, there's generally two steps, which you'll be familiar with. One would be a baseline measurement. So asking the questions, where are we now? What is our performance now? And then we'll make some changes and then we'll monitor those changes and we'll decide whether the changes have been a success or a failure. So we might do baseline measurements over one, two, three months or just over a single blast and then monitor the changes over a similar period. Someone famous someone at one time said that you can't manage what you don't measure. So what we need to look at now is the technology and techniques we have available to measuring what we're doing. That's all the way through the rock breaking process. I split these into two sort of subspecies, simple things and difficult things. Uh, a simple thing for me, really what we're doing day to day. We already have lots of information available on the drilling, blasting, and all the way down through the rock breaking process. But often we find that data isn't collated, calculated, or even recorded. So those simple things are generally relatively cheap to achieve. They should be the things you're doing every day. And then we have difficult things. And by difficult, I mean things that require specialist monitoring equipment, maybe specialist software, some skilled people to carry out the work. And generally, we consider these to be more expensive. 
these difficult things may be the things you do as a campaign. So maybe you make a change, measure for a short while using the difficult things. I've found in recent years that really the technology is emerging to allow us to do these difficult things economically all of the time. And that's what we're doing in some of our special projects. Let's just go through the simple things. Blasting costs. Generally, we would look at these as a cost per tonne of rock produced. Not always quite so simple, because there's always a question about how do you measure the quantity of rock produced in a blast. There's endless arguments between contractors and quarries about how much rock is in a blast. Um, simply, you could take the average burden, spacing, bench height in conjunction with the rock density. That generally can give you an inaccurate value, gives you an estimate. Uh, we're increasingly looking at volumes by doing a pre and post blast drone survey and measuring the volume of rock that's moved. Then we need to ask the question about what's included in the costs. Clearly, we're looking at drilling. Uh, you presumably also look at fuel consumption in the drilling process. If you're bringing a drill rig to site, you have to put in drill rig transport. Clearly, we have the explosives and accessories. Uh, and then we have the label we're using on the blast. So shot fire, explosive supervisor, other helpers. And often life gets confusing here. If you're doing your own drilling and blasting, is that a full-time post? Or are these people doing other jobs? And how do you divide up their costs uh, between the various operations they do in the quarry? Then on top of that, we may have some environmental monitoring costs. Geology, not easy to uh, assess simply and effectively. We can look at the drilling. Uh, so we can, for example, very simply look at the time it takes to drill a hole. So how many meters per minute of drill hole are you generating on a particular blast? You can take rock types from drill logs. Uh, that's really reasonably subjective, so it depends upon the driller. Uh, or I've shown an example below where you take a face photograph. So you can see in the photograph on the left, a very prominent joint across the face. So you would imagine that's going to have an impact on the blast. And in fact, I'll show you a high speed video later on in this presentation showing the effect of that joint on the blast in that particular phase. Um, so that's really an assessment. Um, I've just shown you on the right a video, uh, something I do quite often. It's just a simple uh, video camera, robust video camera with a torch taped to it and stuck on the end of a tape and lower down the blast top. So you'll see the, the results of that. Really quite effective, relatively cheap to do. Looks a good blast style, doesn't it? No, maybe not so good. So that's a very effective technique for just looking down blast holes, maybe checking a driller's log against what you can actually see. I'm a big fan of videos, and I'm certain that every blast should have a video taken of it so that you can sit down afterwards and review the blast performance. Uh, the better the quality of video, the better. It's not always possible to see all the detail. It's best done with a drone because you can look from any angle. You can position the drone perfectly, as in the example below. Just to remind you, if you are using a drone, you need to have your commercial organization. You need to have a commercial license to fly the drone. Glass geometry, that's relatively simple. You will all measure pretty much everything about your glass design and your geometry. And really what we're looking at here is how evenly is the explosive energy distributed in the rock mass. The more evenly the energy is distributed, the better. So we can look at the actual burden of space in between holes at the collar. You get that from the laser or drone survey. We can look at the variability of the burden on the front row of holes. Get that from the profiling. And just as important is the information on the burden of spacing at the bottom of the holes. That, of course, requires the holes to be probed. I've just shown you an example at the bottom of this slide, looking at a distribution of a histogram of the front row burdens in a blast. So that's a nice, simple quality control thing. You can see that the average burden was supposed to be somewhere around five meters, and we've got a distribution about, about that. The less the scatter on that, the better. Digability. This is a very difficult one. You can ask the excavator driver, but I can reassure you, and I'm sure you all know that if you ask the excavator driver, it'll range between bad to really bad. So every operator has a different opinion. 
Um, more scientifically, we could look at the fuel consumption of the excavator, so how much fuel is used against the volume of rock excavated. Once again, the question is how do we measure the quantity of rock excavated? Um, and of course, we need to factor in tramming time between blasts. Oversize, this can be simply from a photograph taken of the muck pile after the blast, so that's really only what you can see at the time. Uh, it's best measured as secondary breakage, particularly the time for an impact breaker. Uh, or if you're using a drop ball, maybe just counting the number of drops of a ball with a simple clicker. The issue we have here is generally assigning that cost or that time to a specific blast, particularly if you're moving oversized to one area and then doing a campaign of breaking. It's difficult then to assign that to a specific blast. Primary crusher performance. You will generally all measure throughput in tons per hour. So it's generally a standard measurement. You could measure power consumption, either a simple log of the power consumed every day, or perfectly uh, a continuous log of power in conjunction with the log of the amount of material being crushed. Uh, we can look at scalpings. Generally, it would be best done via belt wire. It's worth saying that such data you can't really, at the moment, associate to a specific blast. So generally, we'll, we could do it over a month and then look at another month and see if there's been a global change. Okay, moving on to more difficult, more up-to-date technologies that are becoming available to us. So looking at geology first. Increasingly, you'll find available measure while drilling technology. You can get it as a standard fitting on some drill rigs, smart rigs. Um, you can also get it as an add-on to existing rigs. And it's logging drill performance. So the simplest form, it would give you a penetration rate. Or if you've got more detailed logging, you can convert that into a rock quality designation. So a measurement of the strength of the rock down the hole. Now, that can be done, but requires clearly money to be invested, either on an add-on or buying a smart rig. We have one in our digital quarry project. And I've just shown you some output below, so you can see, in fact, we use drones all the time to survey everything on this site. So there's the drone model you can see. You see the red and yellow dots on the surface, that's the surveyed hole colours. So that's the mesh made on the preface and the holes themselves shown. We can then map the burden against the face, so you can see the colours of the burdens there to make sure we've got no underburdened or overburdened areas. And then the bit I'm really interested in is then we can superimpose on that the drill log. So red in this case means high penetration rates. So you can see, I think for every hole there apart from one, there's a good deal of broken ground at the surface of the collar. So that technology is available. Again, looking at uh, difficult but impact of geology, we like to use high-speed videos. Uh, standard video is generally 25 frames per second. We like to use 300 frames per second is pretty good. 500 is great. Don't really need to go any faster than that. And many modern phones can do that kind of frame rate. It's a particularly useful technique when you're looking at oversize. Now, I've just given you an example below. It's actually filmed at 1,000 frames per second. And it's that face we saw earlier on. See a very prominent joint across the middle of the face. If you think that the hole goes from the top of the picture to the bottom of the picture, but you've got the stemming in the top half, clearly you've got less energy above the joint than you have below the joint. Uh, when I play it, you'll see some bright flashes to the left top corner. That's just telltales telling us when the holes are firing. You can see the holes firing there. And very quickly, you can see developing the good fragmentation below that joint and poor fragmentation above. So that joint is isolating the top half of the blast, creating some not such good fragmentation, some oversize. So very clear to see the effect of the joint in that case. Just stuck some more videos in just to show you the impact of geology. So this is, a, again, I think they're all 500 frames a second. This is a, a limestone, standard limestone, if you like. Uh, double decked, again a flash at the beginning. You can see the shot waves arriving at the face. Good fragmentation, no real impact of the geology on that case. This one is completely different, so a very strong sandstone with very weak jointing. It's very obvious in the picture. Again, you'll see the effect of that jointing. So it's a very difficult rock to blast successfully. 
a lot of the energy gets lost through the joints. This one's a basalt, again double decked. Um, the best rock there is to blast, I think, basalt. So you'll see again, shockwave hitting the face. Double decked again, in this case, because of a nearby house. I think you can tell straight away that there's not much oversize in that. What you can also tell from these high speed videos is generally the fragmentation is over and done with within not that many milliseconds. And the one that really gets people going is this one, thinly bedded limestone. It's a carboniferous limestone. Again, I'll play this and you'll see the fragmentation process is completely different. It's really sliding between the joints. So you can see geology has a major impact. We can also measure face velocity. Uh, Use your specialist software with a standard video camera. You just need to video at an angle to the face. You can see the resulting videos here. What you do is you put these, where the yellow dots are, you put markers on the face in the video, not physically on the face. Uh, and then the video the software will track that particular point on the face. So you'll see in that case, you can see around the middle of the face is moving more than the bottom of the face, which is what you'd expect, and not so much movement in the stemming area. This one would run the markers horizontally along the face to see consistency along the face. So we can use these measurements to determine what the optimum inter-row timing is, for example. Just going back to diggability, um, increasing in your fine equipment is supplied with an automatic logging system, and that enables you to follow the load haul system from the face to the crusher. And you can look at cycle times, fill factors, fuel consumption, how many passes it takes to fill the dump truck, how much is in each bucket when it's loaded. And then it is possible to then assign that data to a specific blast. But it does require the operator of the primary excavator to identify which blast they're excavating. It certainly is possible. And then you can follow that material all the way through the process. Post blast fragmentation, that requires specialist software again, and all the methods really require money and manpower, but you can measure in three locations. At the muck pile, just worth noting that all you're measuring there is what you can see on the surface of the muck pile, generally biased towards the oversize, because that's where most of the oversize comes from in terms of where the stemming is. We can measure at the primary, uh, or we can measure downstream of that on the conveyor belt. Now, I'm not particularly interested in conveyor belt monitoring because it's already been to the crusher. So we're interested in the muck pile and primary crusher. So measuring at the muck pile, the way we do it now is we generate a 3D image from a series of drone images. So generally, we'll fly the drone to video the blast, wait for the dust to settle, and immediately fly over the muck pile, taking pictures looking straight down. You need no ground control points or scaling because the scaling is done by the drone itself make them into a 3D model, then we can process this through some software. We get this kind of result. So you can see the size distribution through the photograph you've just seen underneath. So in this case, the crusher, maximum size for the crusher is 1.5 meters, and we have 98.94 below that, so roughly 1% of oversize. And I think it works well for that end. At the other end, we've got fines, but in reality, no, none of the software can realistically measure the fines because uh, it just doesn't appear on an image. So generally they model the lower portion there for the fines. So I generally discount that. Great for oversize and maybe the average distribution, uh, size distribution. We can do that pretty much now for every blast. In terms of measuring at the primary crusher, yeah, seriously expensive activity. So somewhere between 50 to 100,000 pounds to install. Um, you'll see this on quite a lot of the very large open pit metal mines around the world. They are probably using as much explosive in a year as the entire UK, just in one mine. Uh, and the way the system works is that as the dump truck hits into the primary, it triggers a recording system. A camera takes pictures of the material in the back of the dump truck as it is coming out of the dump truck. So a series of pictures. It's automatically assessed for 
uh, fragmentation and then recorded. And with the system you see here, there's an RID tag on the dump truck, which when it's being loaded by the primary excavator contains information transmitted about the location of the excavator. So you can assign it to a blast or even a specific location in a blast. Great systems, uh, don't really know of one installed in the UK. In terms of diggability, one of the things we look at, which can be measured, is bulkage. So that's how much more volume does the rock take up in the muck pile than it took up in the solid. And again, we do that with good old drone surveys again. So pre-post blast drone survey, generally with a post excavation survey as well. And we look at the increase in rock volume. We can also measure the throw. At the bottom of the slide, I've shown you here just a, a cross section through one of these models. The blue line shows the pre-blast. The green line shows the post-blast, and the red line shows the muck pile. And we can take some measurements on that. The one that we favour is the centre of gravity of the muck pile as a measure of throw. So when you're monitoring, what should you consider monitoring as a minimum? Well, I think the things that are readily available to you are explosive energy distribution in terms of the blast ratio and the blast geometry, burden spacings at the collar and bottom of the hole profiles. You should be able to log your drilling and blasting costs relatively simple if you've got rock on ground, and you need to calculate yourself if you're doing your own blasting. Secondary breakage, so time spent on secondary breakage. Maybe if you're using a drop ball, counting the number of times the drop ball was used. And then you should be able to measure already the throughput through the crusher, and if possible, the power consumption through the crusher, either total or peak, and things like maintenance costs. Just to note that for the top one, you can associate that to a specific blast, the middle one, not so easy to do, but it's possible to associate to a specific class. So if you're doing campaign secondary breakage, you maybe need to isolate a pile for a specific blast and then log the time taken to break that. And the final one really you can only do globally at the moment, although we are looking at technology to try and log automatically where the rock has come from. Just thought I'd show you a simple optimization example, because it does show you uh, what you need to do and how you need to monitor the entire process. So this is an example using a sim sim simple blasting, just a single row of double-decked holes. And what we did was just change the delay times. So everything else was kept constant. Everything was always double-decked, same explosive, same burden and spacing, just change the delay times. And we monitored a number of things. For example, we monitored the percentage passing 300 millimeters at the primary crusher. So you can see in this case, we fired at 2550. So 25 between decks, 50 between holes. We fired at 15 between decks, 30 between holes. And we fired at five milliseconds between decks and 10 between the holes. And the best result comes from the shortest delay time. So we had 80% passing 300 mil compared to 65 with the normal delay pattern. We looked at crusher run. Again, that was best with the shortest delay times. Second best was the longest delay times and the worst was the middle. Muck pile throw, not a huge difference between them, but slightly longer muck pile throw with the shorter delay times. This quarry uses the wheeled loader, so they wanted a low muck pile uh, spread out. In terms of muck pile height, much lower height with the shorter times compared to the longer times. In terms of vibration control, decked because of properties nearby. The vibration's gone from 3.6 with the long delay times, and so it's halved to 1.7 uh, with the shorter delay times. Now, of course, you're thinking, this is fantastic. That's just what we want, but there's generally a downside. That's why it's important to measure everything. In this case, the downside is the air overpressure. So that's gone from 7.1 pascals to 25.2, so more than tripled. That's from 111 decibels to 122 decibels. So that prevented the quarry from following up on this. The other behind the scenes story on this one is, of course, that we had a whole load of students working for us on this particular project, so we could afford lots of manpower. So, for example, monitoring what went into the crusher was done by a student standing there with a camera. So to sum up then what we've talked about, we've talked about the fact that you can't manage what you don't measure. We've also looked that you must measure the entire process from start all the way through to the finish and be able to link those all together. And really that's the theme of this is that we can't do that 
unless we're doing it as a team. So we have to measure everything, drilling, blasting, loading, hauling, and crushing, so together as a team. That's the end of my presentation. Thanks, Robin. Thank you to all who took the time out to join us today. Uh, we've had no questions through, but if there is anything that uh, arises, please drop us a line at mail at quarrying.org and uh, we'll uh, get that sorted for you. Um, as with the previous sessions, we'll be making a recording of the webinar and slides available for you to all access. An email with that will be uh, following out from us uh, next week. If you do have a chance, please provide your feedback of today's session on the questionnaire that will be uh, being displayed shortly. Thank you. Oh.